We can see it now. Okay. Someone is going. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're, today we're gonna we're gonna cover the treatment of cancer, which I normally do in really like four lectures. So um, it may be that there are some slides. I sent them, but just not late until not long ago. So you probably don't have the PowerPoint. There may be some slides that have more stuff than you really need. That we're gonna we're not gonna have time, but you can go back and look at them. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and, and I and I eliminated a lot of stuff like I usually talk about drug development and things like that so maybe another time you know we can we can get together and do that stuff after the break and everything okay. so do you know did I post the last lecture because I don't remember editing posting but it doesn't really take long so do you know if I did the last one I think yes yes because I don't like one from uh, Mariana, Mariana Profite. I don't know who that was. Okay. All right. And the other, the last, like, uh, brief note is that if you guys want to connect with me on Skype, I've gotten some, like, Skype invitations, but if I don't know who the person is, I just say no. So if you want to connect with me, you make sure that you say, you know, from you know, ETSM or something, because the usernames don't make any sense. You know, it's like big man 718, you know, I'm like, what the hell that? Are you? You know, so, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about uh, cancer treatment. And, um, you know, I have this quote, which is a very old quote from Voltaire that says, doctors are men who prescribe medicines of which they know little to cure diseases of which they know less, and human beings of whom they know nothing. And uh, it's actually not all that different now than it was when Voltaire said it. Um, we really are taking a lot, there's a lot of guesswork involved, right? There are very few cures for almost any disease, uh, including cancer. Uh, so people always say, you know, how come there's no cure for cancer? I said, well, there's no cure for heart disease or diabetes either. We just treat them. <clears throat> so that seems to be the case for most uh, most diseases, right? <clears throat> and here is one that's particularly uh, relevant for cancer. Poisons in medicine are oftentimes the same substance given with different intents. And so when we talk about a lot of the cancer treatments, they're very toxic, and you probably already know that, right? Because uh, the chemotherapy drugs are very, very toxic. So we're going to get started. I'm going to talk about a little bit about history. I'm going to go pretty quickly through this because we really do have a lot to cover today. But the first written indications about how treatment uh, for cancer was provided actually come from around 2000 BC uh, in something called the Edwin Smith Papyrus, and he is the person who ended up owning it. And uh, in there, there were cases of cancer described. They treated it with heat, uh, essentially what they called the fire drill, uh, which is just a hot, I'm sure they heated something in flame and tried to burn uh, the cancer, right? Uh, but in there, they really state that there's no treatment for cancer that's effective. Uh, you come forward all the way to Hippocrates. He said, leave cancer alone because people that were treated did even worse. Uh, Galen, who is a very famous surgeon uh, at the time, uh, an historically important surgeon, said either surgery or cauterization. And if you see, we go from about... Uh, 130 years BC to 1946, right? Very little change uh, over a really long period of time. I, I It's hard to emphasize more. Uh, there's been very little changes in this stuff. Uh, obviously, our finesse with surgery is better in things, but things are the same. And what they realized, in part because of an accident, because there was uh, a bombing of a ship that blew up and released a bunch of toxic uh, uh, gases during World War II, they realized that a lot of these people that were exposed to this stuff developed cancer. 
And they thought, well, if it can cause uh, these, these leukemias and very low white counts, they saw it was killing cells. They thought maybe that it would be able to be used to treat cancer. And this was the first chemotherapy was actually a nitrogen mustard. Uh, mustard not being the kind you put on food, a different kind of mustard, a chemical mustard. And they realized they could treat cancer with this stuff. And again, to make my point, that uh, this is a pretty barbaric kind of tough treatment. Uh, they are still using nitrogen mustards to treat cancer now. Okay, so so uh, that was 1946, and now we're in 2014, and they're still using these things. Okay, so a lot of the very early cancer treatments are still being used. Okay, uh, in 1948. Uh, a, a guy named Sidney Farber and the Dana Farber Cancer Institute is named after him. Uh, he's a very famous, he is called the father of chemotherapy. I don't know if that's something you really want to give birth to, but he's the father. Okay. <coughs> and um, so he used uh, folic acid antagonist, right? Antagonists are things that block stuff. And I want you to know that when he first did it, he actually was, uh, a lot of the early work was done in pediatric cancers, childhood leukemias, and they actually, he first supplemented with folate, right? They thought that, oh, well, maybe if we give more folic acid, we can actually uh, treat the cancer that made the cancer worse. So a lot of times with these chemo things is trial and error. Okay, so at first uh, Farber thought that giving more would help, and then they realized that it made things worse, so they said, okay, what if we starve them from folate? Uh, and <clears throat> folic acid is a vitamin. Uh, you pro probably are familiar with that. And in the 50s and 60s, uh, they developed new folate antagonists. When they used them in combination, they actually were able to get the first cure ever in history of cancer. Okay, so they accused that they were able to cure the acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia and acute cancer, the first cure. So remember, we started at 2000 BC, we're now 1960s. This is the first time they were able to uh, cure a cancer with a drug. In 1962, uh, uh, a in a big screen that the National Cancer Institute did, they brought in plants from all over the world, all kinds of things, and screened them all. They showed that there was an extract from a tree called the Pacific yew tree, and I think I have a picture of it uh, maybe later in, in, the, in the talk. And it was shown that extracts from that tree were able to treat cancer. Nine years, nine years later, they actually were able to publish the structure of Taxol and isolate the actual chemical that was responsible for the treatment. But I want you to look at the timeline here. 1993, right? So 31 years later, this drug was finally approved for use uh, by, by the FDA. And so this is something that you're going to have to get across to patients that you are probably going to deal with when you have family members that are treated. You're going to see about these new treatments that are being discovered. It takes a really long time to go from initial discovery of something that has anti-cancer activity until it's approved for use in humans. Okay. This one was particularly long in part because it was a very, very difficult chemical to synthesize. And until you can get pure forms, you can't really make drugs out of it. In the 1990s, one of the first of the antibodies used to treat cancer called rituxan, rituximab. MAB here on this, I don't know if you can see my in my cursor, but MAB stands for monoclonal antibody. Drugs whose generic names end in MAB are antibodies. And this was the first one. This is used to treat a B cell cancer. Uh, it was, again, 1997 was when it was approved. My father-in-law is on this drug now. 
right? It's still used, and uh, he takes it. Uh, he comes in to Atlanta to get treated every three months. Okay, the first of the hormonal antagonists, tamoxifen, which blocks the activity of estrogen, was approved in the 90s, late 90s. And in, in 2001, Gleevec was approved. So now we're at least in an era when you guys were alive, right? Finally. Okay. And can remember stuff. Imatinib or Gleevec was as a targeted therapy, the first. And when it came out, everyone said, oh, cancer is all over now, right? Uh, we got this now, right? We're, we're good. Um, so it was approved for use in chronic myelogenous leukemia. That is the cancer that I showed you way back when that, is res that occurs due to a translocation and the activation of the, of the ABL kinase. Anybody remember that? <laughs> right? So Gleevec is used to treat that. And other antibodies have been uh, approved since then. So this was uh, one of the first uh, examples. This was from uh, a study of folic acid when they were first figuring out, right back when Farber was doing his work. In 1971, in, in the U.S., there was uh, Richard Nixon was president, and something uh, big happened in cancer. Uh, it turns out that there was a lot of really wealthy people that were behind this. There was a lot of lobbying, of course, that goes on. But Richard Nixon uh, declared war on cancer in 1971. It was a hundred-word proclamation, and they dedicated a hundred million dollars. Uh, essentially, they thought at that time... When they gave this hundred million dollars, they they thought that cancer would be cured in ten years. Okay, and he said, uh, "I hope in the years ahead we will look back back on this as the most significant action taken during my administration." For those of you that are familiar with Watergate and some of the other things that happened when Nixon was president, I don't think probably it's true uh, that that's the one that people remember the most, but. In any case, the War on Cancer Act, right, the National Cancer Act, as it was called, the War on Cancer, made the National Cancer Institute, which is part of the National Institutes of Health, essentially autonomous in a lot of ways. And so the NIH and NCI are in the same group, but the National Cancer Institute has a lot of autonomy about the way it, it conducts its research, and that has influenced things. But let's look and see uh, in, from a historical perspective, if we look at death rates for, for U.S. males, oops, sorry, for U.S. males, you'll see that from 1930, when the data starts, to 2003, and things haven't changed very much in the last decade to, to alter from this part right here, there are some cancers whose death rates have dropped significantly. Lung cancer, down. Uh, prostate cancer, down. Colon cancer is down. Stomach cancer has dropped consistently uh, over this time, in large part because of the use of antibiotics. Colon cancer is, uh, I mean, stomach cancer is caused by a bacterial infection with Helicobacter pylori, the same organism that causes uh, ulcers in people. And again, we talked about that early in the class, the chronic inflammation caused by that bacteria. Well, as that infection rate has dropped, the cure rate uh, has gone up and survival. So death rate has gone down. Lung cancer is going down in part because smoking is going down, right? I mean, in the 1940s, the, the government of the U.S. shipped cigarettes to soldiers to give them a way to relax during the battles, right? Smoking was, wasn't a big deal. And when they came back from war, it was about a 20-year lag. And then in the 60s, we had women's liberation. And women said, well, if, if men can die from cigarettes, we want to too.
right? And so women started smoking more in the 60s. And so if you look at their curve, it also goes up and goes down as smoking rates have gone down. But importantly, you look at pancreatic cancer, liver cancer, uh, you know, uh, some of these other cancers, the, the survival is up a little, but it's relatively unchanged since 1930. Okay. Uh, so clearly we're not doing a great job in treating, in treating these cancers. Here's uh, another example of survival, percent survival. This is 71 to 2007. You see pancreatic cancer, lung cancer is very, very flat. The other was rates. And so it went down because people weren't getting the disease. Now we're talking about survival. Everybody with me? And when you look at survival, you see how flat the ones that were being survived in the 70s are up uh, some, but they're, they're a little higher. Everything except for pancreas and lung is about a little better, but we have done almost nothing uh, in these cancers. Okay, so it's... I'm sorry? The red one was prostate. Say it again. Here, the red, the, red one is the, the red is prostate. Yeah, yeah, the red one is the prostate. Yeah, I'm sorry you don't have the PowerPoint uh, sooner, <clears throat> but you do have it, so you can. Okay, so again, uh, this is a poster from World War II. Uh, actually, Adolf Hitler was a huge fan of early detection, and they had things in Nazi Germany telling women to do breast self exams. Uh, so back then, in the round the the World War II, there was a lot of uh, prevention stuff that was coming out. People were realizing. That if you can uh, if you can detect things early, then you could save lives. Late stage cancer, uh, the treatments were not good, and actually they're still not good. Right? There is no cure for stage four breast cancer, for example. Now, okay. So, if we look at uh, a couple different cancers, here's ovarian cancer. Uh, by stage, five-year survival, right? If you get early ovarian cancer, localized ovarian cancer, can you see this on your screen? Can you see the data? Can you see the what? Can you see the numbers? Yes. Okay, right? So, so if you get it early, right, five-year survival <laughs> is 93%. Right, 93%, but only 15% of people are caught at that time. More people, 62% of the people, get diagnosed when the cancer is metastasized, and only about one in four of them are alive at four years, at five years. Okay? So uh, this is a huge problem, right? I lost my best friend to ovarian cancer, uh, and it was because when her ovarian cancer was diagnosed, it was already metastasized, okay? She went through all kinds of treatments and surgeries and radiation and everything, and she died anyway um, because it was too late, okay? Uh, again, when you have a, a screening test, that's better, like we have for breast cancer, you get 60% uh, of the people, almost the exact opposite of ovarian, almost the flip, 62. Here we get 60% of people that are diagnosed at localized uh, treatment, 98% survival. There's, there's a reason why there are so many big marches and everything turns pink. I don't know if October is Breast Cancer Month in Mexico or not, but here everything uh, turns pink in October, right? Yes. Uh, do you have the same? Is it October? I, yeah, I think it's something around the world. Like the movement has been uh, globally. Okay, so so October is is breast cancer month. In the U.S. alone, there's two million 
breast cancer survivors that are alive. The reason there's 2 million of them is because 60% of the people are diagnosed early, and if you get it early, those people live. Okay? So you guys in CancerCom, the, the bigger organization, I know that you're interested in, in getting out into the community. You need to get people to get their screening. You need to get people to get vaccinations for the cancers that can be uh, vaccinated against. That is hepatitis, cervical cancer, HPV, etc. Okay? Prevention and early detection are much better than, than the treatments at later stages. Okay? And I know in particular that there is cultural bias against HPV vaccination in the, the more Catholic countries, and I know Mexico is one of those, and that's something that you're going to have to deal with. Okay? All right. You don't see many big marches for pancreatic cancer, do you? No. That's because they're all dead. <laughs> Right? I mean that that that's the brutal truth, right? Okay. Now, one thing for you to understand is that the detection that we have, the methodologies that we use influence rates. Okay? Sorry, I don't know what happened. Uh in, influence the the rates. And, and the survival. So a good example of that is if you look at the incidence of prostate cancer from 1970s to around 2000 uh, and breast cancer. Breast cancer is relatively flat. You see a slight increase in breast cancer uh, over that time, uh, but the absolute difference from 70 or 69, whenever that is, to 99 is not very much. In, in prostate cancer, we see this big jump. Why do we have a huge jump? Did people really have more prostate cancer in the late 80s and early 90s? No, they didn't. But the prostate-specific antigen, the PSA test, was released and approved. And what happened was this test became available. Everyone started getting the test, and they started finding all kinds of cancers. What does that tell us? It tells us that the detection methods matter. It also tells us that if you detect a cancer, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to become something terrible that's going to kill you. It's thought now that, that pretty much any guy that lives long enough will develop prostate cancer, but that's not going to be what kills them, right? That you develop these indolent cancers that won't do anything. I'll give you another example. Thyroid cancer is rampant. If you do autopsies on people that die from other things, not from, not from cancer, car accidents, whatever, right? Just die. If you look at those people, you'll find that a very high percentage, greater than 90% of them actually, will have hidden or so-called occult, that is hidden, thyroid cancer. Was that thyroid cancer going to kill them? No. no. Right? Uh, but it's just very common. It doesn't grow fast. It doesn't do anything to the person. But detection uh, can influence these kinds of things. So that's really important. Right? So, for instance, now in the U.S., the use of the PSA test, that prostate test, which is the prostate-specific antigen, it's a protein that's produced by the prostate cells, secreted and gets into the blood. Now, it's recommended that, not, and I had screening for that for years, right? But now they've come out and said that uh, it's, it's not actually recommended to take that test because it has so many positives, including false positives, that people were getting a lot of biopsies and needles and horrible procedures that really they didn't need. Okay? So I have uh, in here, I'm not going to have time to go over it today. We have good videos on it. I may have told you to watch them already. If I didn't, you should go to the Cancer Quest website and do a search for false positive and for sensitivity and specificity. They're very good videos, actually. I mean, of course, I made them. But the, the, <laughs> but I'm telling you they're good, okay? They're very clear videos that we made uh, to explain those because... 
uh, a test is only as good as it's essentially the, the, the results. Some tests are uh, very sensitive. That is, they can pick up cases, but they pick up things that they shouldn't. And so they yield false positives. And some tests are not so good. They don't pick up uh, a lot of cases. They're not as sensitive. And there are two parameters. There are sensitivity and specificity, That both of those that you need to learn about. Okay, and you can learn that from the video. I hate to just blow by it, but given the amount of stuff we have to do, I don't have a choice. Okay, so go to these uh, pages and, and, and watch these. They're very short, and you'll get the idea. Okay. Okay, so again... Uh, testing, more testing may or may not be better. Okay, so this was sort of the argument people were making about PSA testing. The last time I went uh, to the doctor, they did not do the PSA test because uh, he said, you know, they don't, they don't do it anymore. The newest approaches to detection are, are essentially what they now call liquid biopsies. And there's a bunch of different people working on this. This is going to be when you guys are physicians, when you guys are working in lab five, ten years down the road. Uh, I mean, you may be done sooner than that, but these tests will be much more common uh, in a few years. Uh, these so-called liquid biopsies, what they're looking for now in the blood are either nucleic acids, DNA from the cancer cells, or more now, what we're finding is that we're going to be able to detect the presence of cancer using microRNAs. Okay? And the latest results on that, and I'm talking in the last few weeks now, the latest results show that for a wide variety of cancers, they can be detected at early stages by looking at microRNAs that are found in circulation. These things are released from the cells and exosomes. Uh, small little membrane uh, things. Some maybe some of them are not even uh, in bub in lipids, but uh, this seems to be the way things are going. Uh, that we're going to be able to detect these things looking for microRNAs in circulation. Okay, and <coughs> these tests are not just in the. Hi, Mariana. Welcome. Uh, th these tests are not uh, just in the laboratory. This test uh, called Cologuard, uh, it actually detects pre-malignant, this is the key, right? Pre-malignant colorectal neoplasia. Does everyone, can you see in the box? Yes. Okay. So remember we said neoplasia, new growth, neo, new. Neoplasia means new growth. And so that you can actually detect these things before they become cancers by looking for DNA. Okay. In this case, it's in the fecal material uh, because colon cancer, the easiest thing to do is to get some poop, right? And look in, in, in the fecal material. And this actually was approved now, this test. When this was, uh, when I made this slide, it was not, but this test was recently approved for use. Okay. I'll catch you all up, Mariana. What I said up till this point was what all the treatments for cancer suck. Oh my God. Okay. Thank you, man. Was that a pretty good summary? Yeah. Oh my God. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> the the main types of treatment. Okay, we did a little we did a little history of cancer treatment and stuff, man. You can catch up. But the main the main three branches of of oncology or cancer treatment doctors, right? Uh, the the science of treatment of cancer is oncology. Are surgery. <laughs> Drugs, which is medical oncology, and that includes all of the chemotherapy we talked about briefly, and as well as all of the, the antibodies and things. Those are medical oncologists. And then radiation oncology. Okay. Additionally, the things that are that treat that, that are used to treat patients are bone marrow transplantation. And uh, then there are now complementary and alternative medicines. 
the new uh, politically correct way of talking about CAM, the new term that you'll see in the literature and that you'll hear uh, people use is they now call it integrative medicine. Integrative medicine, right? And the treatments for cancer can be either curative, that is the goal is to cure the patient, or palliative. And palliative care is something that you guys should look into, you need to learn about a little bit. Historically speaking, palliative care is, is usually, when people think of that, when you talk to an older person who has cancer and you mention palliative care, they're going to think it means they're going to die. Okay, because in the old time, right, the old school, palliative medicine was essentially the same as end-of-life care, right, uh, hospice, the person's being put into the hospital to die or go home to die. That's when palliative medicine became uh, involved. And really, when, when people think about it, uh, they're thinking about treatment of pain, you know, giving patients morphine, things like that, okay, but the new palliative care, right? The, the, I, I'll get you in one sec. The new way of looking at palliative care is that it should be integrated from the very beginning of treatment. When, when you guys are navigators, when you're working with patients in hospitals, right? That hopefully this will, this will come to pass, right? Or when you're clinicians and you're treating cancer patients, you get the palliative care people on board at the very beginning, right? Palliative care is the treatment of symptoms, of side effects, of nausea, of vomiting, of pain, of uh, any of the fever, right? Any of that stuff. These are people that are trained to deal with that, and they should be on board from the beginning. Yeah, Marianne, you had a question? Yes. Um has the tuition been regarded as part of palliative care in any way? I'm sorry, it's just hard to hear. Sorry, I'm sorry. It like gets like an echo when you're too far. And I was asking if nutrition has been regarded in any way as part of the, of the palliative uh, treatment or care? I mean... That's a great question. I, I, wish to, I wish people thought of it more. We'll talk about it briefly at the very end, um, but the answer is, in general, the medical oncologist, the surgical oncologist, they, in, in the U.S., I can only speak for here, uh, they really don't address nutrition in any way substantively. So there are uh, social workers and people that, that, that will talk with the patients and say, you know, when you're on chemo, like for instance, you should not eat raw vegetables when you're on chemotherapy because you're immunosuppressed and you may get a bacterial infection. There are some things that are harder to digest, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then there, but, but it's not treated the way it should be in my, in my estimation. Uh, to answer the question. Okay. Um, uh, so first, surgery. Uh, this is an ancient uh, graphic of uh, a woman who had uh, a massive growth on the side of her face and ear, and they removed it. And if it's uh, essentially the surgeon's uh, motto, heal with steel, right? You cut it out. You, you, you use a scalpel. And, and if, in fact, you can remove all of the cancer cells from someone, uh, then they are cured. Uh, uh, unfortunately, with most surgeries, it's not possible to tell if the person is uh, totally cured or not. And so even when people have surgery, they very often have radiation uh, and, and or chemotherapy to make sure right, that all of the cells are gone and none of the cells left the cancer and metastasized before it was sur surgically removed, right? Uh, there are some cancers that are just cut out and you're done with it, right? Skin cancers and things like that. This, this growth on, on this person was uh, almost certainly a benign tumor, right, uh, that, that was not cancerous. They lopped it off, taking a bit of her ear, uh, uh, as well, 
and um, definitely was a cosmetic improvement, if nothing else. Okay. So what are we looking for in a cancer drug? We want something that's highly effective. Efficacious means it's doing what you want it to do. All right, efficacy says this thing is doing what we, what we want it to do. And so we want something that's highly effective. We want something that has low toxicity. We don't want this thing to make us sick. And this is actually where most of the standard chemotherapy drugs fail. They're very toxic. We want something that has good biological availability. And that's a fancy way of saying we want it to get where we need it. So, for instance, if someone has brain cancer, it's very difficult to get drugs to that because of the blood-brain barrier, right? There, there is something that prevents uh, very tight cell-cell junctions that prevent things from getting into the brain. So that a drug that doesn't get across that barrier is not going to have good biological availability. Does that make sense? We want it to have a reasonable half-life. You don't want to have to give this, this drug every three hours in order for them to have a dose that's high enough. Uh, but we also don't want a drug that lasts for two months in the person. Right? You want it to have its effect and you want it to go away. There's a reason why you take, uh, if you guys have an, a headache or something, you take Tylenol a couple times a day or Advil a couple times a day. You don't take it every 30 minutes. And you don't take it and have it last. You don't want those enzymes inhibited for a month, right? So a reasonable half-life. You have to have an easy way of administering the drug, right? Most of the chemotherapy drugs, the standard chemo drugs, are given by intravenous infusion uh, over a period of hours. That's not ideal. In a perfect world, they would take a pill, right? Is that because it's so toxic or why? Yeah, I mean, it's because, yeah, it's the way they give it slowly over time. I don't know that, I mean, some of the older chemos actually, like my, my father-in-law did take a pill. It's just some of them cannot be formulated, then they're not stable. You know, the, the, you know, they can't be made into a pill that can be absorbed and get into the body in a high enough air and in in thing. With his pill... He took, he took like a bunch of little teeny pills all at the same time, actually, and, uh, and, and when it worked. And the last thing that is price, okay, and, and this is something that's obviously under huge debate in the U.S. and elsewhere because the newer cancer drugs, the targeted therapies, cost thousands and thousands of dollars per month for, for most of them. Okay. And, uh, I mean, we're talking about a lot of money if you're going to take this uh, every couple weeks or even every couple months for years. Uh, it, it's a huge amount of money. Okay. So uh, pricing actually is, is relevant. Okay. Now, uh, Mariana, I, I told the other people that were here uh, at the beginning, I have a lot of drugs listed here. This is like a four day talk okay i usually give four at least four lectures on treatment and we're gonna do it in an hour or so uh hopefully uh so i'm gonna kind of put i put them on here but i'm not gonna go over all of them okay uh you can go back and look at it i figured it was worth keeping it on the slide for you yes, thank you okay um i have removed a lot of the slides um, but we can try to cover drug development some other time or something. <laughs> so the, the standard drugs, the drugs that people refer to as chemo or chemotherapy, are almost all cytotoxic drugs. They're, the goal of these drugs is to kill the cancer cells, to induce the cancer cells to undergo apoptosis. And... The way that they work is by taking advantage of the fact that cancer cells are genetically unstable. They're genetically abnormal. And essentially, in, when the, if you hit a normal cell with this toxic chemical, 
the normal cell will recognize that it has been damaged and the cell cycle will be stopped. And the cell will either affect repair or actually if it's too damaged, it, it'll die as well. Um, but uh, they can stop the cell cycle. In cancer, essentially the cell cycle is broken. We know that. We talked about that. P53 is gone. RB is gone. We have oncogenes that are driving the cells forward. They continue to divide even when they've been damaged and they enter essentially what we'll, we'll call it a suicidal mitosis. They, they go in, they try to divide when they're so damaged that the offspring of this division is, are not able to function. Right? Transcription is so damaged, the DNA is so broken that you cannot make a functional cell and, and the cancer cells die. And so you can see you can see why these drugs are pretty toxic. Okay, so I'll I'll mention a a couple of them. Okay, uh, the first one that was discovered, really one of the very first ones that was discovered, was cisplatin, and this is what it looks like. It's a platinum-containing compound. Here in the middle, you have the platinum. Someone was actually doing experiments. They were looking to see what the effects are of electricity on cells. And so they put electrodes into the, the solution that the cells were growing in. And they, and they realized that the cells died. And they thought, oh, is the electricity killing the cells? And they were smart enough that they took the liquid and put it onto new cells. And they realized that those cells died. And what it happened was that when they did the electric flow, the platinum had come off of the electrode. Uh -huh. And the platinum from the electrode was actually causing DNA damage and killing the cells. So it wasn't the electricity, but that led very quickly to the use of these platinum compounds to treat cancer. The... the um, <coughs> Cyclophosphamide is another DNA damaging agent. Methotrexate, this is the drug that I mentioned that Sidney Farber worked with. This is a folate antagonist. It, it blocks DNA synthesis. 5-fluorouracil, an analog. There are uh, a whole group of drugs that, that work by blocking the topoisomerases. Uh, they are derived from... Uh, plants. This is this one is derived from the May apple, right? This one is topo tecan. It comes from something called the happy tree. That's a great name for something that makes a deadly chemo drug. Yeah. Right? Right? The happy tree, and uh, and doxorubicin, uh, which actually uh, is also called adriamycin, is a very common chemo drug used to treat breast cancer. It comes from a soil bacterium. So all of these drugs block topoisomerases. Do you guys know what a topoisomerase is? So what, what, do, what do they do? I see you spinning. <laughs> Right. Okay, exactly. They unwind the DNA. So there are two forms of topoisomerase, topo1 and topo2, and their their job is to unwind the DNA so that the replication or transcription machinery can come through, right? And what happens with these drugs is they jam those enzymes. So you cut the DNA, but you don't glue it back together. Okay? So that turns the topoisomerases into pretty potent mutagens, right? They're chopping up the DNA. Okay. There are uh, drugs that work as spindle poisons. Uh, they block the spindle fibers, the microtubules that, f that uh, separate cells and drag chromosomes around. The one that I mentioned earlier was uh, Taxol. It's from the Pacific yew tree. This is, this is uh, a very common ornamental flower up here called Vinca. But uh, what I'll, sh I'll go through that. This is where Taxol comes from. This Pacific yew tree, it's an evergreen tree. Uh, and as I said, it was discovered in the 60s and approved 
over 30 years later in the 90s for use. It took a really long time. Uh, there are very few of these trees around, and to harvest it from the bark of the tree is not reasonable, and so they had to come up with a way to synthesize it. And uh, this is what the chemical looks like. It doesn't look easy to synthesize, does it? No. Yeah, right? Um, and uh, crystal meth, so much easier, right? So, uh, so, so this drug, uh, it took a long time uh, for people to develop it. Actually, someone in, in uh, Florida developed a synthetic mechanism that worked, right? Uh, and they were able to come up with this stuff synthetically. So that's chemo. Their, their job is to kill cells. The next thing uh, that is used to, to treat cancer... is <laughs> truck yeah the next thing is this used to, the, the, the next thing that's used to treat cancer is radiation x-rays uh, high energy beams um, isotopes so here is a vial they used to take this vial of radioactive material and actually tape it right to the place that needed treatment. Uh, uh, implants, which is the use. So, so there are two kinds of radiation therapy. There's X, what's called external beam. That is a source shoots high energy radiation from a distance toward the cancer. And then there's something called brachytherapy brachytherapy, which is the use of wires or needles or catheters to get the radiation very close to the tumor itself. Okay? These were uh, uh, this independently suggested by Pierre Curie, the winner of a Nobel Prize, husband of Marie Curie, winner of several Nobel Prizes. Right? Uh, the only woman, she won Nobel Prizes in two different disciplines. What a babe, right? Okay. And Alexander Graham Bell, do you know that name? Okay. So uh, the inventor of the telephone and the husband of uh, Marie Curie both suggested radiation as a treatment. It was actually used very quickly. Okay. These are some more modern radiotherapy beads. You can see them in comparison to a penny, how small they are. These would be put into a syringe and then implanted. Like this is the kind of thing you would use to treat prostate cancer. They call them seeds. They're about the size of a grain of rice, maybe a small grain of rice. And, and they can be implanted into. Okay. So why would you use radiation to treat Cancer. What does radiation do to cells? It also matches your DNA. Absolutely, right? It causes DNA damage. Okay, and, and the, the types of radiation that they use, they cause DNA damage two ways. One is directly. If an x ray hits DNA, it will snap the backbone. You'll break the phosphodiester linkage. You actually cleave the DNA. Okay? The second way, and it's the much more common way that radiation works, is when the radiation comes through the cell, the chances are that the beam is not going to hit DNA, right? Because that's only a small area. But when it passes through the cell, the radiation, because it's ionizing very strong radiation, it knocks electrons off of things, it generates uh, reactive oxygen species that float around until they hit something and cause damage. So it's the indirect damage that's more common. Okay. So this is how they used to use it. This is old school brachytherapy. You literally take a vial with some radioactive material in it and you tape it to someone's face. Okay. Oh, wait, sorry. This was the first patient ever treated by external beam radiation therapy, this young boy right here. He had retinoblastoma. He had eye cancer, right, caused by the RB mutation. 
everything comes around, see? Okay, so that RB mutation we talked about way back when, this little boy was treated with this machine and he survived. Okay? This is what it looks like now if someone is going to have radiation to their head or neck. They actually make a mold uh, based on that person by molding warm plastic over the person. They mark it so that they know that that person's going to be in exactly the same position each time. Okay? And they can use marks uh, here to position. They actually use lasers to, to line up the beams. Okay? When women have breast cancer treatment, they very often will inject a small amount of dye in several places around the lesion to do that same thing, that they can triangulate and make sure that they're treating. They can even take into account the fact that your breast or prostate or whatever moves when you breathe. Okay? And... In order to minimize the damage caused to normal tissue, they actually, especially for brain and some other uh, very sensitive areas, will use multiple beams that are each of a low, low dosage that converge, like the Death Star in Star Wars. <laughs> right? All the beams come out and converge in one place. Right, and then uh, that area in the center is killed, but these low amounts of radiation that pass through cause less damage in the other areas. Okay, and then this was uh, I know we're really pressed for time, but this is just too cool to not tell you about. I just can't help myself. <laughs> These people, these people developed a radioactive seed that forms a seed because it solidifies at higher temperatures. Normally you think of things getting solid at lower temperatures, right, like ice. But this stuff actually solidifies at higher temperatures. So they take a syringe of it and you inject it right where you need it in the prostate and it solidifies and puts the radiation exactly in the tumor. Then, because it's made of amino acids, over time it breaks down and gets gets dissolved and broken down by the body so it doesn't leave anything behind. Okay? So this is very cool, but it's this is from 2012 and it doesn't exist yet in people. Okay? The newest type of radiation, and I put this up because this was the groundbreaking at Emory for this facility. There's about a dozen of these in the U.S. Emory's going to have one uh, in a couple years. It's called proton beam therapy. And I'll show you uh, quickly what it looks like. When you, when you treat someone, if you look at the graph on the left, if you treat someone with x-rays, Right As it hits their skin, a lot of the, the energy gets absorbed right when it hits the skin, and it slowly goes down. It gets absorbed over time. And what that means is that all the normal tissue in front of the tumor that gets hit gets, gets damaged. And then, of course, after the tumor, that x-ray keeps going, and it damages everything afterwards. Okay, So it looks like this. Right? You see this first column? Right? Most of the dosage is here somewhere in the tumor, but you get all kinds of dosage on both sides. Using protons, this is more of a particle, and it has a it has a very specific the protons with a very with a given energy leave the machine, they fly a very specific distance, and then they stop and fall down. It's like from Matrix. Remember the, the movie Matrix, how the bullets all flew and he stopped them and they all fell? This is what happens. They all go a certain distance and they, they deliver their energy and they stop. Okay? And so that's the promise of this therapy. And that's what it looks like here. It goes, look on this bottom right corner. The energy goes in, it hits, and then you don't get any of this, this radiation to the back of the skull or brain, right? The spine is spared. You see that? 
Okay, so that's the theory. We don't know yet because this is very new technology. We don't really know if it's better for patients yet. Okay, but that's the idea. Okay, now the side effects of chemotherapy right, can be horrible. And this is what you're going to deal with when you're, work, when you're dealing with patients. They're going to have side effects. The side effects are due to the fact that the, 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 the cancer drugs, the chemo drugs, have, they, don't, they kill the cancer cells. They push them over the edge, so to speak. They're damaged. They can't stop. But because they're causing DNA damage, there's a lot of normal cells that are rapidly dividing, and those cells also get damaged, right? A lot of them put the brakes on, but a lot of them get damaged. And all the effects that you see in cancer patients are caused by that. So the bone marrow, rapidly dividing cells, our, our blood is constantly being replaced. The bone marrow cells get damaged. It leads to low amounts of red cells or anemia. And of course, that leads to fatigue and all the things that go along with that. And the patients also become immunosuppressed. Right? They're white cells, so they're more prone to infection. So this is why these people should stay away from crowds. They shouldn't be on public transit if they can avoid it. Okay, You don't want to be anywhere where you can get an infection. And it's also the reason why they need to wash their vegetables and cook vegetables before they eat them and things. Because you, know, you go out, you pull something from the garden and eat it, you, you could get a bacteria that wouldn't normally make you sick. But because of this immune suppression, it can. Right? Many, many, many cancer patients die, not from the cancer, but from infections that they get because of the cancer. Okay? It's a major reason that people die. There is uh, metabolic effects from chemotherapy, including hypercalcemia. Okay? Uh, and uh, hypercalcemia is too much calcium in, in the blood. It's also caused by the growth of metastatic cancer in bones. The bones get broken down. Uh, and so you see hypercalcemia affects kidney function and it can cause, uh, it, it can in fact be lethal. They, the people have nausea, they have GI problems, in part just because the cells, I don't know why they make, every, why all the reasons they make you sick, but certainly the GI tract is turning over. The cells on the surface are turning over and uh, dying. So they get mouth sores, uh, the, they get um, what's called hand-foot syndrome. The technical term is peripheral neuropathy. Patients almost never call it that. They call it foot, you know, foot, hand, or glove syndrome, or whatever, because our ner the nerves are very long, right? Our nerves are some of the longest cells we have, and because these uh, agents like uh, Taxol are interfering with microtubules, these cells have a hard time moving things from one end to the other, right? Microtubules, that's your highway system in a cell. And uh, so they can get this peripheral neuropathy. They get uh, chem what, what patients call chemo brain, that is cognitive defects. Okay? And uh, this, some of these things go away, like the nausea and GI problems go away after the patients stop taking the drug. But some of these things, like the peripheral neuropathy, can last forever. Right. So they need to talk. Yeah. Can you explain us uh, more detail? Chemo brain. Chemo, <laughs> chemo, chemo brain, right, which is what patients call it. Of course, the doctors would don't call it that. Is something that, that's actively being studied now. They seem to maybe have identified some parts of the brain that are affected. For a long time, the doctors didn't even acknowledge that it was real. But essentially, it's short term memory issues that patients have when they're going through the therapy. Bye bye. Bye, thank you. Okay. So the, the, the exact physiology of it is, is not clear yet, but uh, if you ask a patient, they'll tell you it's real. Okay. So yeah, I wish I could tell you better, but really we don't know that much. Okay, thank you. Yeah.
So we have to we have to do better, right? So one thing that we need to do is to target the right genes. Okay, and I have to I have to go quickly because I know I'm I'm behind uh, with this. We uh, we want to give the right drugs, and so what's done now is molecular testing. Okay, you don't want to put someone on a drug that they're not going to respond to because they don't have the right mutations, and so more and more and more and more. We're looking at molecular testing to say, is this person gonna gonna respond to this drug? Do they have the mutation that this drug targets? Okay. And that's just more and more common. This is something you can look up and read about yourself. It's pretty cool in which they use mice. They actually take the tumor from a person, put it in an animal, and then treat the animal with different drugs to see whether or not that the cancer responds in vivo. Yes, it's a mouse. Yes, it's immunosuppressed, but it's better than a dish, right? Okay. Uh, and uh, we want to be able to detect recurrence, right? Again, if cancer, if cancer uh, could be turned into something more like diabetes, where it was a chronic disease that didn't spread, uh, we'd be okay. And so people are looking at blood tests, including those RNAs, to look for uh, things that can cause, um, uh, we can predict recurrence. We want to study the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of drugs. That's routinely done. Uh, pharmacokinetics is, is a way of saying what does the body do to the drug. Pharmacodynamics has to do with the metabolism, right? What does the drug, I mean dynamics, I'm sorry, kinetics is what does the body do to the drug? Dynamics is what did the drug do to the body, okay? Sorry. I'm talking too fast to, uh, okay? But the newest thing that people are doing now is called pharmacogenomics, and that is, looking at the patient's genes to see whether or not uh, the dosage that's being used is appropriate. And this is particularly important in children, right? Because clinical trials are mostly done in adults, and then we try to translate that to kids, and kids are different, right, biologically. So uh, it, it seems to be working. And and now people are actually trying to get more quantitative. If any of you have a bent toward quantitative things, if you're good in math, if you like modeling, there's a huge future in oncology for people who are able to look at, at data sets, bioinformatics, big data, modeling, uh, for predicting uh, therapeutic responses. Okay, This is the first one that I ever saw. Uh, right? So, so this was the first one. They actually have a department in integrated mathematical oncology. Okay. And these mathematical models can do a good job, right? So this model outperforms doctors in predicting cancer patient outcomes. Okay. And that was uh, in April of 13, so over a year ago. Right. So it, you may have uh, seen a, the, the TV show Jeopardy that there was a computer, Watson, the IBM computer that, that won Jeopardy. And that computer is being trained to diagnose cancer. Okay. okay. So I'll skip this. There, there are some treatments that are used. A very common in breast cancer and prostate cancer uh, and, and some other cancers. Uh, they're used to manipulate hormones, essentially starving the cancers of the growth factors that they need. Okay. Uh, there are uh, cancers, a couple of them, in particular melanoma and some of the uh, kidney cancers, which are treated with uh, naturally occurring compounds like interferon and interleukin-2, which st are designed to stimulate the immune system. Okay, 
And vaccines are being used to treat cancer, to, to uh, cause the, uh, the patient to recognize an existing cancer, as well as to prevent cancer, like HPV vaccine, right? or the hepatitis vaccine, which reduces liver cancer. Right? That was really the first cancer vaccine. It just wasn't sold for that. The angiogenesis we talked about earlier and there are a host of drugs that are being deter that are being used and developed both to treat angiogenesis so far these drugs have not lived up to their promise um you know it seemed like a great idea when folkman was working on it it's still a good idea and they're still used but what happens is that if you block a single pathway the cancers tend to just bypass that and use a different uh, pathway to get their blood supply. So uh, there's not been uh, great cures and stuff with, with these kinds of treatments. The newest therapies and, and pretty much the rest of what I was going to talk about, a lot of it is this. We'll, we'll probably have to stop here. But the, the biggest group the biggest bunch of all the new treatments are designed to inhibit kinases. And so this was a, a, an article that came out uh, uh, in, in like the 90s, I think, right? I don't know if you can read the date. It's pretty blurry. But, but this was 20 years ago at least. There is new ammunition in the war against cancer, and these are the bullets. And this was when Gleevec came out. The first of the targeted drugs, right? And people said, ah, you know, this is it. Uh, and, and it turns out that, that what we're doing now is developing kinase inhibitors. These are targeted uh, drugs. They bind to kinases. When the drug companies first developed these, they thought of it like other treatments. You want it to be as specific as possible. You want to target one thing because you don't want to cause lots of effects all over the body. Does ever, that make sense? If you're a drug company, that sounds like a bad idea, right, to target a bunch of things. And so they, they wanted things to be very, very specific. What we're now learning is that that, that model, that paradigm, fancy word, right, that paradigm for drug development is, doesn't work for cancer. And they're now coming up with drugs that target multiple kinases. And the, the expected result of that is that you would get more side effects. And that's probably true. But if you can block two or three important kinases that this cancer needs, unlike blocking one, they can't go around it. Right. Uh, so they're using these drugs in combination and they're using drugs that target multiple things to try to inhibit that end around that 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 ability of the cancer cells because they're heterogeneous to bypass the path that's blocked. Does that make sense? Okay, and really that that's mostly what I was going to talk about. There are some other things like this where they freeze the tumor, cryotherapy it's called, where you put a probe that has liquid nitrogen in it and you freeze the tumor, right? You can use a high frequency, uh, like a radio frequency ablation where you put a probe in, a bunch of things come out. And it releases high energy that heats the tumor. You see 71 centigrade in the background. Okay. So you can cook the tumor. You can freeze the tumor. Uh, and there's, there's lots and lots of uh, new approaches. What I'm going to let you read on your own is this section on drug resistance. Because if the cancer treatments work, we wouldn't be sitting here today. Right? The problem, in, in, in a nutshell, is the heterogeneity that you see. When you have uh, a bunch of blue cells and they're all different color blue, if you, if you eliminate all the dark blue, you end up with some pale blue. And that's what happens in cancer. You often get a dramatic response. You treat someone, the cancer shrinks, goes down, 
And then when uh, a couple cells that are missing that target or change to use a different pathway, they start to grow and come back. That, that, that drug is no longer useful, right? So the, 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 that is a reason why when you, when you talk to cancer patients, they're often taking two and three drugs at the same time, right? And that's the reason. We want to try to prevent that evolution, that, that evolution of resistance. Okay, but I'll let you look at that because I know it's it's a quarter till, and I wanted to talk with you for a few minutes about uh, working on the Cancer Quest project. Correct? Okay. So I'll let you look at resistance. If you look at the PowerPoint and you have questions, just write me.